Thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about immunizations for adolescents but with a primary focus on HPV vaccine, which is near and dear to mine and Sabrina's heart. Um, so why vaccination? Uh, first of all, it's widely thought that sort of one of the 10 most important public health achievements of all time is vaccination. And for many years, we were focusing really on childhood vaccination. Uh, and then in recent years, we need to focus on adolescent vaccination as well. And the two adolescent vaccines in use in Uganda are tetanus and HPV. I'm going to talk about tetanus just very briefly because, again, the focus will be HPV. Um, but there's been some recent changes, from my understanding, in talking to Sabrina. So now it had been the tetanus had really been focusing primarily on childbearing women and pregnant women, but now actually um, males, uh, teens are also being vaccinated. There was also a recent change from tetanus, using tetanus toxoid to using tetanus and diphtheria, so to cover for both of those. Um, and the schedule is five doses, and this is the, uh, it's important to make sure that you do follow the minimal interval between doses so that the doses are most effective. Um, I think it will be mixed when some kids are getting it in childhood, there may be catch up in adolescence, they may not get all five doses in adolescence, um, but this is the uh, recommended uh, dosage. Um, So focusing on HPV, so why are we worried, why do we want to get all these teens vaccinated against HPV? Um, first of all is that we know that there's a uh, very significant association between HPV or human papillomavirus infection and cancers. And there are 12 high risk HPV types. By high risk we mean um, there are some types that are low risk where they cause, don't really cause a problem or maybe cause general warts. And there are 12 types that we consider to be high risk because those are the ones that we know can lead to cancer. And if we look at kind of the breakdown of the different types, um, the, the dark blue is type 16 and 18, so that's the, the, type, the two types that have the most amount, or, or uh, the biggest association with cancer. And then there are these other three, five types there, um, which are 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. Uh, and if we kind of add those together, the two types 16 and 18 are in the bivalent vaccine, which is the original first vaccine that came out. And then if we put all of the tips together, that's what's in the 9 gallon vaccine. So you may sometimes hear about, say, Gardasil 4 versus Gardasil 9, or a non-avalent vaccine versus a quadrivalent vaccine or a bivalent vaccine. And what that means is there are different numbers of cancer um, causing uh, strains that we're covering. And then there are also the, the quadrivalent vaccine also covers two strains that have caused general warts. And we know that worldwide, these two strains, 16 and 18, are responsible for 70% of cervical cancer. So if we know if we can get people vaccinated, we really can make a huge impact on cervical cancer. And while I'm focusing on cervical cancer here, because that's the um, focus also in Uganda, it's just important to remember that HPV HPV's um, infection is also linked to other cancers as well. So cervical cancer is on the top. You can see on the bottom is oropharyngeal cancer which is less of a problem here in Uganda. It's a very big problem in the US. Um, and, and then you can also see a number of other cancers, you know, uh, vagina, vulva, anus, rectum, et cetera, and penis, penile cancer as well. So what about in Uganda? So we know that cervical cancer is the leading cause of female cancer in Uganda. And last, the, the latest data to come out, which just came out a few months ago, there were over 6,000 new cervical cancer cases um, in, in, uh, diagnosed annually in Uganda, and about 52,000 across East Africa. Um, and that number of 6,400 is actually increasing. So if we look at that same data from two years ago, this information is about 1.5 now. So we know that it's not decreasing, it's increasing. And based on a study done here um, at Malago, women are coming in for treatment late. So 72% of women are coming in for late stage diagnosis. And so then what that leads to is about four, over 4,000 cervical cancer deaths annually. And cervical cancer is the leading cause of death in women in Uganda. And from the Kadando Cancer Registry, we know that 50% of women with cervical cancer who come in for diagnosis die within three years and 80% within five years. So it's not that people get cervical cancer, come in early, get treated and survive. People are coming in very late, and that's one of the problems with cervical cancer is that people don't necessarily know they have it um, if you're not doing screening for it, say with a, with a pap smear. But again, if we can just prevent cervical cancer, if we can prevent HPV infection, we can prevent these cancers from happening. 
And so if we compare against the rest of the, of the world, we can see again that cervical cancer incidence um, is higher in Uganda, and, it's, and so is mortality. So what can we do to prevent it? Right? So we, part of what we do as physicians, we want to we prevent disease. So to, we have to understand kind of the natural history of HPV. So what happens is people get exposed to HPV, they get an infection, and about 70-90% of people clear the infection. So they clear the infection and they're, they're fine. Their body, their immune system took care of it. But the remaining get a chronic infection. And because of that chronic infection, they get a lot of inflammation, and that's what causes the cervical dysplasia, which will become cancer. Now, we can pick up the cervical dysplasia if you're doing screening, say, for pap smears. You can do a, treat, you can do a surgical treatment of the cervix, and they can recover. But if that's missed, then about 10 years later, roughly, the woman can develop cervical cancer. If it's caught early, then you'll, we can do treatment, surgical treatments or chemotherapy. But if not, then obviously it leads um, to death. So we know there are a lot of factors that increase cervical cancer risk in addition to HPV. So some of them here are smoking, diet, um, different infections. But what about factors that decrease cervical cancer risk? There are actually only two. The first is an IUD, interestingly, but most importantly is vaccination. So that's why we really want to focus on getting people vaccinated so we can prevent this cascade from occurring. So I talked a little about the vaccines, that there are these different types of vaccines, but what's really important to know is this vaccine is very, very effective, very, very efficacious, nearly 100%. So if we can get girls vaccinated, it's, you know, it's not 100%, they won't get cervical cancer, but their risk of cervical cancer drops a huge amount. So the target population for the world, according to the World Health Organization for most countries is young adolescent girls aged 9 through 14. And here in Uganda, the target's been age 10. And then they say if there's sufficient resources after you've kind of have gotten the 9 to 14 year olds, then maybe you can focus on catch-up vaccinations for the ones who've been missed, who are over 15 years. And the goal is to vaccinate before sexual debut. So that means is you want to vaccinate before there is any sexual content, contact whatsoever, and long, long, long before. So that's why the focus in Uganda is at age 10, and in the US is age 11. It's basically the same, because you want to make sure that you're getting kids vaccinated before they can be exposed to HPV. So what about vaccinating boys? That's a little more complicated, in part because the first priority has been to has been the focus on cervical cancer and to have timely reduction, um, a timely vaccination of young girls with high coverage. And, but they've said, so what happened in the US is it got rolled out to girls first and we couldn't get the coverage high enough. So when they did the modeling, they said if we could get the girl coverage in the 80, 90%, then HPV will be suppressed in the population and we, won't, we don't need to vaccinate the boys. But because we couldn't do that, then they started, in about 2009, we started vaccinating boys as well. So now we vaccinate both in the US. Um, and that's based on the cost effectiveness models. But as we talked about yesterday, for those of you who were at the conference, boys often do kind of get left behind in sometimes adolescent health. And there are reasons to vaccinate boys other than just protecting you know, their future potential partners. Um, is that, again, remember I showed you that Boys can get, HP, can get HPV vaccine themselves can get cancer. They can get oropharyngeal cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, and they can get genital warts as well. So there is a reason to potentially vaccinate the boys as well if, it, if we can and ultimately have the resources to be able to do that. So the goal for the, the national program um, in Uganda is to hit 80% coverage, and I'll show you some numbers in a few minutes. But what's a little complicated about HPV is it depends on the, the age that you're starting vaccination and how many doses you need. So if you initiate vaccination before 15, then you only need two doses of the vaccine. And those are six to 12 months apart with a minimal interval of five months. So if, if you give a dose now, you can give a dose five months later or longer. If you initiate at age 15 or older, you actually need three doses. And that's because the immune response isn't as strong in the older kids. And you can see the, the um, intervals here. Also, if the adolescent's immunocompromised or HIV infected, they need three doses. Because again, they, don't, they can't mount their immune, the immune response to the vaccination. 
So some common questions that we get all the time is, I have a 15-year-old who got their first dose at age 13. Is, is it the age that you initiation or the age they are now that decides the number of doses? It's the age of initiation. So you don't need to worry about how old they are when they come to, in front of you. If they started before 15, they, need, they only need two doses. The other question we get a lot is, what if the vaccination schedule interrupted? So I saw a child, you know, a kid, and I wanted them to come back in 12, six months. They came back five years later. Do I have to start again? You don't have to start again. So if it gets interrupted and you're not going along the same schedule, you just give the second dose and you're done. You don't have to worry about how long it's been. Um, there's, and again, there's no maximum recommended interval, but we say around you know, 6, 12, 15 months because again, we want to get the both doses in before sexual debut. So the longer you wait, then the longer there's a chance that the child could be, or the adolescent could be exposed. And then if you have, sometimes you end up with different brands, you can use the different vaccine brands interchangeably. So if, you've, if you started the series with one brand and you get another brand at your site, that's fine. You can just give the second dose with the other brand. You don't have to worry about that. Okay, so just to see how, how well I've explained this and how well you're listening, we're gonna do a couple of cases. So um, there's a girl, she received her first HIV vaccine dose um, on her 15th birthday. How many doses is she gonna need? Three, perfect. So three doses because she started when she was 15. Perfect. You have a 13 year old and she got two doses of the HPV vaccine and she received one dose when she was 12 and one uh, four months later. How many more doses does she need? Does she need more doses and how many more does she need? One. And how come? Because she got two doses, why does she need one more? Okay, because the minimal interval, it was at four months. So it wasn't the five month interval, because it wasn't the five month interval, she needs, now she's gonna need that third dose. So it's really important to make sure to pay attention to the intervals. And that's for all vaccines. I actually just had gotten an email while I was here for someone who was catching up vaccine doses who was a, a, a child. And the pediatrician didn't wait, you need to wait a month between live vaccines. And so they gave a varicella, a chickenpox vaccine that we give in the US, and then gave a MMR vaccine, you know, 20 days later. They didn't wait long enough, and so now that child's gonna need another dose. So it's important just to make sure those, even though we say six to 12 months, five months okay, just make sure you wait those five months. Okay, case three. 16 year old received one dose of HP vaccine two years ago when she was 14. How many doses does she need in total? Right, just one more because she started before she was 15, so the fact that she's 16 now, that doesn't matter. It's, it's the age of initiation. Great, perfect. So how are we doing in Uganda? So according to the DIS, the D District Health Information System, and I understand that this data um, may not be the same as if you go into the community you're collecting by uh, the vaccine you know, per child, but according to the, the governmental data, um, the coverage rate for the first dose of HIV vaccine is 85%, but the second dose is 41%. So in general, girls in Uganda, for the most part, are getting their first dose and they're not necessarily coming back and getting their second dose. And so there's a path study that was done, which is stakeholder interviews of children and parents and administrators and religious leaders and a number of other people in these five districts. And they found that the key driver for um, getting the HP vaccination, the key driver for not getting it was vaccine safety. And I think from my understanding from talking to, to Dr. Sabrina and Dr. Nicolette, Dr. Ezekiel, Dr. Mapere, is that that's been, it was a, a bit of a problem for this MR campaign too, in terms of those questions about vaccine safety and vaccine hesitancy. And we see it in the US as well. That's what we've, we've definitely seen a big rise in vaccine hesitancy. And their concerns were the vaccine administrations, was it being administered correctly? They thought the vaccine could, could cause infertility or was toxic in some way. They thought it was too much vaccine, or too many vaccines in a short time. At that time, some of the, those were being three doses, so you're trying to give too many vaccines. Um, and then it was a new vaccine. In reality, it's been around now since 2006 is when it was first licensed in the US and other countries as well. So it's not a new vaccine anymore, but you know, but compared to, I guess, the polio vaccine, it's considered to be a new vaccine. The good news, though, is that a recent study that was done here in McCary is that um, in, other, in interviews from a different group, the initial rumors and fears and concerns has seemed to kind of waned over time. So there are still some lingering concerns, but it does seem that that's improving, which is fantastic. 
And they found that the perceived benefits of cancer protection was a really important message. So if families really understand the vaccine as a cancer pr protecting vaccine, that really um, was associated with, with acceptance of vaccination, as well as understanding that it really is a safe vaccine. So those are the two things that were really important. And I could tell you it'll be the same. In studies in the US, it's exactly the same, right? You know, it's, if we go back to kind of the classic public health model, health belief model, you have to believe that your child's at risk. You have to believe there's something you can do. So if you believe it's the risk of cancer, this vaccine can protect them, and it's safe, and that's how we end up with behavioral change. So how do we know that it's safe? There have been a lot of studies. This is probably one of the most studies, studied vaccines that there has ever been. There's no increased risk, and people have looked at all sorts of stuff. Allergies, stroke, blood cuts, autoimmune disease, you know, you name it. Um, and there has not been any association. The only association they ever found was a skin infection where you gave the shot. But that's, you know, any vaccine. It's not particularly the HPV vaccine. But again, it's a very, very, very well-studied vaccine. And another study that was done here at the, C at the CHDC kind of was talking about the communication strategy around HPV. That it was important to disseminate accurate information, to develop messages with positive perceptions, to raise awareness, to promote HPV vaccine understanding, uh, and understanding that it's safe and effective and it's been used worldwide, and then really to publicize endorsement by government and community leaders. So it's really important that leaders in the community are also promoting the vaccine. Because if we as health professionals are saying, get it, but you have a community leader who's saying, I don't think it's a good vaccine, then the family is going to listen to the community leader, and also they're going to listen the, to the doctor. Okay, so what are some of the common things that you may hear? So I'm afraid of the vaccine side effects. That's why I don't want my child vaccinated. So what do we know? There can be local reactions, as there can be for any vaccines, but they're really short and they resolve on their own. The most common is injection site pain. So kids do say that the vaccine is painful. Although it's funny, I have to say that I think in our clinic, the only ones I see who have trouble with the pain are the boys, that they're the ones who end up going into the waiting room and then they faint. But the girls, <laughs> but the girls, okay. Um, but it's not so much severe pain. It's, it's not usually not very severe pain. You can get redness, you can get swelling, but the systemic reaction, so things like fever or headache or other things, are relatively rare. But even if they have them, it's fun. You get a vaccine, you get a fever. It just means the vaccine is working, right? Your parents don't need to be afraid of that. The second we hear all the time is, well, my adolescent will never be risk at HPV ever. Um, so some things we say is HPV is very common, um, in fact the most commonly sexually transmitted infection, many people don't even know they're infected, but a lot of families you, you can't say that to them, and so I think what's worked for other families to say, you know, I know that your, your daughter will never have sexual relations before marriage, but their partner could have been infected by HPV before they got married, and so don't you want to protect your daughter in case their partner ever, was ever exposed, and that has worked for some families. They'll say, why, why am I giving my 10-year-old this vaccine? You know, if, if it's, if it's, you know, if we're worried about HPV, why aren't we giving it when we're older? And so what we say now is, look, we know the vaccine works better when it started earlier. In fact, if I start it now, your child only needs two doses. If I start it later, they need three. So isn't it, that just shows how it's better to give it when it's earlier. We know that the protection is long-lasting, so we give it early and it lasts for many, many years. And we know that the optimal effectiveness is if we can do it before there's any sexual activity. So again, that's why we really want to start early. Some families say, I don't want the sex vaccine. They, they think of it as a sex vaccine. And this is where it went wrong in the US. So there was this rollout, and it got rolled out as a vaccine to protect against sexually transmitted infection and against, um, against uh, STIs. And families were like, no, I don't, I don't, want, that, I don't want that sex vaccine. And what we should have done is really promote it with what it is. It really is a cancer-protecting vaccine. In fact, there are only two cancer-protecting vaccines in the world. There's hepatitis B, which now we give when they're infants and babies and so that people don't think about it that way, but it really is a okay, protects against liver cancer because of hepatitis B infection, and HPV. And if you ask anyone who has cancer, if we had been able to give you a vaccine to protect you, or to say a mother whose child has cancer, who has a cancer, if I could have given a vaccine to protect them, every parent would say yes, right? What parent doesn't want to protect their child? 
they'll say, other parents will say, giving the vaccine is encouraging my teen to have sex. This was all over in the US was, your, your is a sex vaccine, if I give it to my child, it's telling him it's okay to go have sex. There was, have been a lot of studies, in fact, there have been 21 different studies with over 500,000 participants, and they looked at all kinds of things. They looked at age of first sex, sexual behavior, contraception, all of these things. There has never been found an association between being vaccinated and any of these sexual outcomes. So we can say for sure that vaccinating your child with HPV is not going to lead them now suddenly to become sexually active or have risky sexual behaviors. We also hear, well, I'm afraid that my adolescent can get HPV from the vaccine. So they're worried about the vaccine itself causing HPV. We know that the way the vaccine is made, it is not a live virus. So, for example, so there's some vaccines that are live viruses. HPV is not. It's a little. It's a part of the HPV viral protein coat that's been been killed. So there's. It can't reproduce itself. It can't be infectious. There's absolutely no way that you can get HPV from this vaccine. So those are the kind of common things that I've heard. I was actually just wondering if you guys heard any other ones or any other barriers or things that families have told you or asked you that I didn't cover? Infertility. Infertility, yeah. So we hear that too. One thing that we say to families actually is we know there's no link between the HV vaccine and infertility. But I do know there's a link between HPV infection and infertility because if you end up having cervical cancer and you have to have a, if your child is here as a, a young woman has to have a procedure to take care of the dysplasia, we know that can lead to infertility. And so I try, we try to sort of flip it around so that it's actually the vaccine is what's going to protect against that, not cause that. Are there other ones that you guys have heard? Yeah, back there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the education should be between uh, standard procedures and it should be various procedures. Oh, do you mean decrease the service to help decrease or increase? Wait, wait. It's interesting. I know that it decreased the HIV transmission. That's been shown. I actually I, I can look into that. I actually don't know if there's a um, a link between decreasing HPV and circumcision. That's a really good question. Yeah, I don't know that. Other yeah. Thank you very much. I like the information, but uh, this is such a uh, this about that information. Uh, it's very easy to communicate to me in English, and, and I actually apprehend it. But the mother down there in the village who I'm going to tell you your daughter needs a vaccine. Yes. He needs to understand this information. So yes. what what efforts have you made to make sure that we translate this information? The local yeah. 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 That's a good question. We haven't, but we could. So we, we could work with, with Dr. Sabrina to think about how, how can we how can we take the message that we know that work in English and translate them into Luganda. That would really be a fantastic idea. What I would say though is what we know from talking to families is you don't want to give them if they're not asking, don't give them too much information. So one of the um, things we do is we come in and we say. I have this vaccine, and I know you might be worried about it being unsafe, and let me tell you the reasons why, and then we want you to work this, we want this, we want this, and the family's like, so what we say is, we, we say, uh, we talk about a presumptive approach, which is today I'm gonna give your child a HPV vaccine. If they say, great, you're done. Don't, they, they've agreed to it, just let it be. Don't, don't, don't open up more information. If they say, oh, what, what is that vaccine? You can say, it's a, or if they say, no, I don't want that, you can say, it's actually a really important vaccine that will help protect your daughter against cancer, against cervical cancer. And we know that in Uganda, there's definitely high risk of cervical cancer, and we want to protect, we want to protect your daughter. If they say, great, we're done. If they say, here's important, if they say, if they start to have questions, ask them what questions they have, and when they, you want to have in your toolbox, all the answers to the questions they may have, but don't put it in their head. So if they ask you, what about sex, if they heard the sex vaccine, you can say, actually, let me tell you what I know about that. So be ready to answer the questions they have, but don't put the questions into, into their head. If you were going to say Okay, the challenge of all that is, yeah. I've seen this on what you mothers. When they start the medication, when they start the medication, and the yeah. child reacts, if the doctor didn't tell them, they will go to another doctor and they say, my child was well and they gave them this. Yeah. And this is the conversation you have about yeah. this yeah. The danger is, 
I can tell them that that's not a joke. Tell them how you feel, but I guess yeah. it's okay. No, that's a good. Thank you for. Actually, thank you for making that point. I would actually talk, we do sometimes talk about the common side effects. I wouldn't go into all of the other things, but we do sometimes say, look, this, this vaccine might hurt a little bit, your daughter will be fine, you might have a little fever, it's fine, it's normal. And I actually very much agree with you because in my other life I also studied flu vaccine. And in the US, one of the, the reasons we hear people don't want the flu vaccine is they're all sure that flu vaccine causes the flu, which it doesn't. But after they get the vaccine, like they feel a little achy or they have a fever. And I'd like to say, you know, we kids feel APM fever after they get, you know, the, the diphtheria vaccine, and we don't think they have diphtheria, but because the symptoms are like what you might have with the flu, they think it's the flu. And so I really have come to believe that if we give the right, we call it respiratory guidance, if you say, look, this might happen, it's totally normal, then when it happens, they don't worry. And if you're right, if you don't tell them when it happens, they think it's got to be something wrong, and then they won't come back and get that second dose. So you're right, the, thank you for pointing out. The first, I would say, normalize the normal reactions, but don't go into the other, other, other things unless they ask you. But if they ask you, be ready, and we can definitely work on getting that information. Yeah. Any other things you go for? So, uh, I've really got to know that and I have to say this someone who's very special. And what's happening in Uganda, uh, most of the centers, when an adolescent goes there, they are treated for the particular diseases that they come with. Health workers are not, they are aware that we don't know whether they are taking it for granted or we really don't know what is happening. Uh, so, what strategies can we bring? to see that these adolescents are seen and may be referred, for example, in Apple, because when the immunization is, is really going on in our way, in the hospital, yeah. but adolescents are few, of which I think there are very many outside there, yeah. but many co-workers are not. What strategies do you And on top of that, what strategies do you use in Colombia outside there? Can we share with you? Yeah. <laughs> I think actually we just met, um, I don't know, they Sarah Zalongo, who works and does a lot of oversight for the ACCA for the law majority. We were actually just talking about their, the Ministry of Education is actually cheap, is important, and we should have the moving these vaccines to the routine vaccination schedule. So the hope is over time that the, the, the health workers and the health corners, just like they give TDAP and polio and they're giving the child vaccine, they should be giving each vaccination to all of the girls as well. So I think over time that will change. I think what we're, Betsy mentioned the grant, what we're trying to do is get funding to be looking at different ways to outreach so that not only are the healthcare workers vaccinated, but we're trying to, in the community, have good education information, particularly via text message. The families are trying to promote them to come in so that the parents are asking for it too. So it works best is that the families want it and come in and the healthcare workers are giving it and not losing the opportunity to visit. So that if one of them sort of forgets, if the couple doesn't have it and the family says we want this, then they can, if they have it, they can give it, or they can say, come to the Friday at 11 and then you won't give it. But we need it on, we need it on both sides. So then that, we've done a little bit of that work in Columbia too, which is why we want to bring that particular thing here. And we've been working the past couple of years, along with Lila and Justin for sure, kind of really get the whole team here to really try and see if we can kind of get that going here. Thanks to the partnership again, all comes the partnership between between that and we have and then the well building on that. Thank you. Not that much to you. Uh we have a meeting not only we those things we talked about they have platinum. Yeah, but they're already social attacks. Yeah.
there's no there's no danger of giving if they had HPV or they have HPV, there's no danger of giving the vaccine. You don't have to worry that it's somehow more dangerous to give it. It's, it's fine. That, that's the show. I just want to say that I got to my HPV vaccination at 38. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Abu, and many thanks again to the Minister.